stream. We're excited that you're here. Um, I sure do hope that my friend Rupert um, is listening. This is a song that Rupert um, sang with our choir many years ago, and I love to hear him sing it. We won't do it justice, but um, I want you to listen close to the words of this song that says, We have one more river to cross. Troubles and trials in my little lifespan. When I'm standing alone and the battle gets hot, I always do the best I can. I must have crossed a million valleys and shed a million tears. When I come to the river of Jordan, hallelujah, I will have no fear. I will have no fear. about me since I walked this narrow way. This is just another little valley. I came through it when I prayed. I've climbed a lot of high mountains and crossed a lot of little streams. But when I see old Jordan cold and dark, that'll be the last for me. That'll be the last for me. scarred hand. I, I believe that with all of my heart. Um, I want to tell you that um, I was tremendously blessed this morning as I walked on the grounds and saw the yellow ribbons um, that you've came and tied here at our church. Um, this is our statement that with God's help and his will, we'll be home again. Um, this church is um, looks really strange to be here um, and not have your faces here in front of us, but I can tell you um, that His Holy Spirit is here, and we praise Him for that. Um, so we just want you to know that we love you, and you know um, we thank our governor um, for allowing us to continue to do this. Um, he had a very um, he had a webinar Friday morning that Ricky and I were privileged to be part of, um, where he said, in fact, that he encouraged us if we had been having online church with 10 people or less that he wanted us that that was what God's people needed so we are thankful for a governor who has put his faith and trust in God 
Um, and so we just are thankful that we're here with you this morning, and we just want to worship with you. Um, don't forget um, to send in your tithes and offerings. If you need that address, you can let some of us know. We'll get that to you. Drop by the church. The ribbon is on the front porch. Um, tie a ribbon anywhere you want on the campus. There's a great place to walk around our road. Get some exercise and fresh air. That would be great. Um, before we go any further this morning, I want us to um, pray together the Lord's Prayer. So um, if you're there with your family, um, you can grab their hands. If, they're, if you're there alone, just reach out, um, touch your Bible, um, um, maybe a picture, just something. But even if you are alone, know that you're not because God is there with you. So if you would, let's just bow our heads and let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, oh, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. Amen. So we're going to do a medley for you now. These are some really old songs, and um, we, we heard your comments that you liked the old songs. So um, we've reached way back. So I hope that you'll enjoy this. Um, sing along with us. Guides us with his eye 
and we'll follow till we die. And we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, 
to send his sweet spirit and dry troubled eyes. It is my greatest honor to bow at his feet. God has been good to defeated. Oh 
Well, good morning, friendship. It's good to be with you. I wished we could all be here together, but we are together in soul and in spirit, even though not in body. And I've been thinking a lot this week about just how much I miss the church and miss congregating together. But I am so very thankful that we have this means of coming together uh, in our hearts and in our souls to worship our Savior in spirit and in truth. So we love you. We want you to know we're praying for you. And every day we're praying that God's going to turn this thing around and, and his will is going to be done. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know what it's going to take. Uh, but we know this. As the song that they just sung, we've already won. We're already victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that he is my Savior. I'm thankful that I've been saved by his marvelous grace. I'm thankful to know him as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to share something with you uh, this morning uh, in the way of beginning uh, this message today. And uh, this was on my desk calendar at, at home in my study. And, and I looked at it and I thought, how fitting for the time that we're living in. Uh, I don't know when this calendar was, was printed. I don't know how long ago, how old it is or anything like that. Uh, but I know the message uh, that was on uh, for this particular day's devotion is very relevant for the circumstances that we face today. And this is what it says. The title of it is The Way to Permanent Faith. And this is, listen to what, what the message is. Do we not see God at work in our circumstances? Dark times are allowed and come to us through the sovereignty of God. Are we prepared to let God do what he wants with us? God is never in a hurry. If we are willing to wait, we will see God pointing out that we have been interested only in his blessings instead of in God himself. And I thought how true that is. The scripture passage for that day was John 16, 32. Indeed, the hour is coming that you will be scattered. And I thought how our churches today are scattered. We're here and there. We're not together uh, in the four walls of the building. But I think we've all come to realize in a big way that the church uh, is each one of us individually, that Christ dwells in our hearts individually. And we together are the church. And so wherever we are, we're still the church of the living God. We don't have to be in a building. We don't have to be within the four walls of a sanctuary. Although I know the Bible teaches, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but we are here in the house of God and we are the church of God and we need to remember that during these times. And so one of the things that stood out to me where it said, God is never in a hurry. We get in a hurry. I want this to be over tomorrow. I mean, I want it to be over now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't want it to keep going on. But God is never in a hurry. If we are willing to wait, he will show us how that we've been so interested in his blessings instead of in God himself. And we want the blessings of God. We're all interested in the blessings of God. But I want to tell you something. How interested are we in God himself? How interested in are we in what God would have uh, for each of us to do in our lives? So we have to wait on God. I, I thought about the song that was sung earlier, and I love those old hymns, and some of those I hadn't heard in a long time, and it blessed my soul. I stood over there and, and cried as they sang those songs and sang along with a lot of them, but uh, one of them, uh, one of the lines that stood out to me was this, all the saints of God are gathering home. And, and I thought, you know, in the sense that that song was written, they're talking about that day when we all gather home in that beautiful place called heaven. But I couldn't help but think about the day that all the saints gather back home in the sanctuary of God here at Friendship Church, there at Coal Mountain, there at Oak Grove, there at Harmony Grove, wherever your church is, all the saints of God are going to gather back home. And when we do, I believe there's going to be such a hunger of God's word. There's no telling what kind of revival is going to to break out. There's no telling how many people is going to be saved by the grace of God if you and I will be faithful. I'm going to be totally honest with you. Uh, yes, I have worried about the state of our economy. Yes, I have worried about uh, the future for our children and, 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 and grandchildren and, and on and on. And I know that you have too. But I'm going to tell you something. Are we more concerned about the blessings of God or are we concerned about getting to know God one-on-one uh, -on -one like we should and like 
like we ought to. It's good to be saved, but we're justified at the moment of salvation. But I'm going to tell you something. We're in the period of time known as sanctification because we are saved, we are justified, but we're also sanctified, which means we continue to be saved. We are. It's a process. And so uh, that's the period that you and I are in now. And in that sanctification period is when we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, last week about resurrection, and we're still fired up about resurrection because what else can you think about during Easter season than the resurrection? I heard the other day, read it as a matter of fact, someone posted, and uh, my wife, uh, or it was shared with me through an email, uh, some reporter made the statement that, well, this is for the first time in the history of the United States, uh, there wasn't going to be an Easter. And I thought, How, what a ridiculous statement to make. No, we might not gather at the church house. House, but you can't stop Easter the same as you can't stop Christmas. Amen? Because uh, Christmas is not about Santa Claus and, and gift giving and all that. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus. Well, what is Easter about? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The coronavirus has not stopped the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why would we not celebrate Easter, right? Why would we not celebrate the resurrection of our Savior? So I'm fired up about the resurrection. I told you I, 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 this was going to be my next Bible study uh, on Wednesday nights. And, and one day, uh, I believe we'll get back around to it. But uh, we've been reading and studying in this little book called Experiencing the Resurrection. It's by a gentleman by the name of Henry Blackaby and his son, Melvin Blackaby, uh, uh, they, two men of God that wrote this book. And it is, it's been a, an extraordinary read thus far. Uh, I can't go through it and read. I'm, I'm constantly underlining and, and marking things in this book. And uh, there's just so much, but, but it's touched my heart, and I want to continue on in that vein today. I want to talk about the gospel. You know what the gospel is? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, right? That's what the gospel is. But the gospel entails these things, and it is the cross, it is the resurrection, and it is the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost. All three of those intake, uh, entail the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Christ. And believers, you and I as believers in Christ Jesus, we need to understand and experience all three of those. The cross, the resurrection, and the Holy Spirit. We need to experience every one of those. But listen to this. Without the resurrection, the cross is meaningless. Without the resurrection, the cross would be of no benefit. It would be of no value. Had Christ have simply died on the cross and there had been no resurrection, there would be no salvation, right? And so I want you to think about that. The cross without the resurrection is meaningless, okay? A cross without resurrection would bring no salvation. There would be no hope. How do I know that? Well, look in your Bibles, if you will, in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul had some things to say about this, and we'll share it with you in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you've ever uh, heard much about chapter 15 or you've read chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, you'll find out it has a lot to say about the uh, resurrection. It is the resurrection chapter if you will, in uh, the book, uh, in the, uh, uh, the Bible, in, in the New Testament. And we'll begin reading in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 with verse 17. Listen to what it said. This is what Paul said. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Did you hear what he said? Paul says very, right here, very plainly, if there had been no resurrection, then our faith is useless. Our faith is futile, and we're still in our sins. In other words, without the resurrection, we'd still be sinners. We'd still be lost. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Those who died with a faith in Christ, had there not been a resurrection, there'd be no hope for them as well. If in this life only, listen, don't miss this. Paul says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If this is it, Paul says, if there was no resurrection, if we had no hope of eternal life, if it was simply the cross and Christ had died and that was it, he said we would be of all men most miserable. I think Paul knew what he was talking about. 
And you know how Paul knew so well, and you know why he, he, he understood so well the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because he had seen him and heard him for himself. When he had his little experience on the road to Damascus, he experienced the Lord Jesus Christ one-on-one. -on -one. And so it was, uh, he knew what he was talking about because he had experienced him in his life. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you, it, our experience may not be like Paul's. Most of our experience is not anything like Paul's on the road to Damascus. But if we had experienced him in, in, in his resurrection, then we know salvation lies in the Son of God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go on and read a few more verses. In, uh, look at verse 20. Uh, my, my Bible gives a little uh, heading here for this, this uh, series of verses. It says, the last enemy destroyed. The last enemy destroyed. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he goes back, he refers back to those that have fallen asleep in Christ. And had there been no resurrection, how they would have simply perished. But listen to what he said. Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So there it is. Those who have died with their hope and faith in Christ, there's nothing to be concerned about. There's nothing to worry about because their hope is in him and because he is resurrected they too will be resurrected for since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead so since by man by man came death who's that man he's talking about Adam when he sinned in the garden of Eden man sinned and therefore death came into the world but because of that man Jesus Christ the son of God Listen to this. It says, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Even so in Christ. So in Adam we die, but in Christ, guess what? We are all made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Did you hear that? He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Certainly, this virus that we face today is certainly an enemy. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Where more? What, what better news could we get than to realize it's going to come under his feet? And then listen to verse 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, <laughs> we, every one of us, there, there's, there's one thing. I talked to, uh, a few Sundays ago about certainty, and I talked about uncertainty. And I, and I said there's not anything that's really certain on this earth, but there really is one thing that's certain. And you know what it is? We're all going to die. We're all going to die. We're going to face that time. There's a man in the Bible in the Old Testament. His name was Elijah. He was a prophet. And the Bible says he was walking along with Elisha. And Elijah was kind of a mentor, I guess you could say, to Elisha. And as they walked along, guess what? God just came down and took him and carried him on to glory. Elijah never faced death, natural death, like, you and, like I'm talking about. There was another man, Enoch, I believe, in, in the Old Testament. And the Bible said, for he was not, for God took him. Why? Because he was righteous in the eyes of God. And God took him. But I want to point out something. There were other people, there were other people that died twice while they were on this earth. You say, what are you talking about? You remember one time there was a man came to Jesus and said, you need to come to my house because my little daughter is at the point of death. She's going to die if you don't do something. And they went and that little girl died. She died, the Bible says. And Jesus said, why, well, she's just asleep. And he went in and, brother, he brought her back to life. And there was another fellow. They said the, son, the only son of his mother, she was, she was a widow. She had already lost her husband. And there they were carrying her only son out to bury him. And Jesus walked up to that castle and he touched that young man and he rose up and began to talk with him. And then a man named Lazarus that was placed in a tomb and Jesus called him and said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, come out of that tomb. And I'm telling you, brethren, they rose from the dead. But there's the thing I'm trying to 
trying to get across to you. They experienced death two times on this earth. They died once and Jesus raised them back. And then they died again. But when they rose again, brother, they'll never die no more. And when you and I die, we're never going to die again. Because in heaven there ain't no death. <laughs> In heaven, where we're going, we'll never be separated. There won't be no social distancing in heaven. We can hug next all we want to, whenever we want to. I'm telling you, church, listen to me. I don't even like the term social distancing. Matter of fact, I'm getting sick of it. Because here's what social distancing tells me. Social distancing tells, tells me I need to turn my back on you. But I'm telling you, we, don't, we can be six foot apart and still be social. We're here today. There's eight of us here. And we can still be social. Amen? We don't have to be social distance. Yes, physically distance. I understand the concept. I understand what they're trying to get across. And I'm trying to be careful. And I know you're trying to be careful. Because I don't want to get sick. And I don't want to make anybody else see and you don't either but listen to me we don't have to be social distanced we can still communicate we can still talk so why don't we call it physical distance you know we're physically distanced for a little while but the day's coming church listen to me when all the saints of God are going to gather back home and we'll tell the story and I believe we'll tell it you know you know what I woke the realization hit me today this morning I thought about this. There's a lot of people got up this morning and it ain't any different than any other Sunday morning's ever been for them because they didn't give two thoughts or they didn't give a second thought. They didn't give one thought about going to church to begin with. Well before he ever heard anything about coronavirus, many of you out there today, and this is going to sound harsh, but I've just got to be blunt this morning. Brother, we live in different times, and I'm not here uh, to dilly-dally around and sugarcoat what God's given me. I'm here to say the truth, and I believe one of the big reasons we're in the condition we are today is because we simply have not took our relationship with our Savior as serious as we should have. We want the blessings, but we don't want to put the work in. We want the blessings, but we don't want to do what it takes to get there. We just want God to pour it out on us, just like we want the government just to give us something, give us something to make it all better. But I'm going to tell you something. There's Christians out there, maybe some of you that ain't give a, a thought in a long time in going to church well before the coronavirus ever hit. Well, wake up. Wake up. It's time. And when we get to come back together, every church in our little communities all around these North Georgia hills ought to be packed to the seams with God's people hungry to come and hear the Word of God, hungry to come and get back in the relationship that God's wanted all the time. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. That last enemy that's going to be destroyed is dead. Listen. I'm going to die on this earth. I pointed out three individuals that died twice while they was here. But I'm definitely going to die one time unless I was to be blessed like the old prophet and, and God just simply come take me home. Wouldn't that be something? But I don't see really, you know, it could happen. You know what might happen? Uh, I read the other day they, there was an earthquake uh, somewhere in Idaho just the week before. There was one in Utah. And I thought earthquakes in diverse places, uh, the pestilence and the disease. I thought, God, what are you trying to tell us? But here's the thing. <laughs> Irregardless, Irregardless, I'm a winner either way. If God comes and takes the church out of this, if God just comes and takes us out and takes us home, glory, glory, glory. It's all because somebody touched me. It's all because I've been saved by the grace of God. I've got Jesus as my Savior. What about you? What about you? Oh, church, I'm telling you, <laughs> Yes, we live in some trying times, but people's lived in trying times before. We want to pout and, and whine and complain about, oh, it's never been this way before. Well, I bet you you could go back and talk to some of our uh, older generation and they could tell you about some hard and some difficult times that they went through. You could talk to some of these old great grandmas that lived through World War II when they had loved ones over there on foreign soil fighting for our freedoms and they could tell you how they spent time on their knees like they never had before. 
They could tell you about times of sickness when we didn't have doctor's offices and things. We talk about how we were, were so ill-equipped and how uh, we don't have enough of this and we don't have enough of that. And I'm not, I'm not negating that in the least. I, I cannot for the life of me fathom how we can live in such a nation as we live in and that be the case. Uh, but listen, back in those days, them folks could tell you when they didn't have a doctor that they could just run to down the street or they didn't have a good hospital facility they could take loved ones to. Brethren, they had to stay there and just simply depend on the mercy of God and pray for God's grace and His mercy and pray for God's healing. That's what they had and that's what they did. My grandpa said one time, he said, son, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, a lot of people talk about them good old days. <laughs> he said, but there was a lot of things that wasn't so good about them. There was a lot of things. You know why? Because he lived it. He understood it. He knew what it was about. And oh, you and I have sat back and reaped the blessings of God. And we've done it at the expense of our relationship with him. And God has slapped us upside of the head and said it's time to wake up. <laughs> it's time that the church start being the church. It's time that God's people, if you call yourself a Christian and you've truly been saved by the grace of God, uh, get off of the bass boat on Sunday morning or, or wherever it is that you are besides being in church and get yourself to the house of God and assemble yourself together like you ought to. Well, I'll probably get condemned for some of this, but that's all right. It may be the last time I ever get to preach. I don't know. Well, the way things are today, we walk outside and take a breath of air. Who would ever thought the very air we breathe could kill us? But then again, hadn't it been that way all along? <laughs> when it comes right down to it, hasn't it been that way all along? So there's a reality, and that reality is sin. Y'all know that? That reality is sin. S-I-N. And according to Romans, Paul tells us in Romans 3, 23, every one of us are guilty. He said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He goes on further a few chapters over in, in, in Romans 6 and 23, and he says, for the wages of sin is death. Now, how did Paul know that? that the wages of sin is death. Well, he was simply going back in Genesis 2, 17 makes this statement. This is what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And guess what? They didn't believe him. <laughs> They went ahead and they ate that fruit and they died. You say, well, they didn't immediately fall dead. Oh, yes, they didn't immediately fall dead. That is true. It might have been hundreds of years later, as a matter of fact, according to the ages in the Bible. But the day came when it says, and he died. Adam died because of sin. You and I die because of sin. You and I experience things like we're experiencing right now because of sin. It's just that plain. It's just that simple. There ain't no need in pointing fingers and trying to paste blame here, there, and the other because every one of us corporately bear a part of the blame. You say, oh, I don't like that preacher. You saying, I helped bring this thing on. I'm saying every one of us are guilty of sin. And when the world fell because of sin, we fell right along with it. And the only hope we've got is in a man named Jesus. A man named Jesus. So here it is. God's nature is perfect. Did y'all know that? God's nature is perfect. And his nature is perfect love. How do I know? Look at 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 8 and verses 16. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 it says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And verse 16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. God is love. So his nature is perfect. His nature is love. And God's thoughts are pure. And God's ways are righteous. God's ways are righteous. Our ways aren't righteous. We need to understand that. We can't fix this. 
Our government can't fix this. And as blessed as we are with a wonderful health care system and brilliant doctors and brilliant nurses and people that know their stuff and researchers and all, and we're all praying for them folks and we're all praying that they'll find treatments and we're all praying that they'll find a vaccine that'll help against this pandemic. We're all praying for those things, but I'm telling you something, they can't fix it. They can't fix it. If we've, if we've come to understand anything in these last several weeks, it's just how little we are on this earth. Right. It's just how little we are and how little we actually know. Brilliant minds all over the world working for the same cause. And they've had some breakthroughs, mind you. It's not all gloom and doom. They've had some breakthroughs, but they still don't have all the answers they need. God is holy. Humanity is sinful. A holy God, a sinful humanity. God is all powerful. And guess what? Humanity is completely helpless. Let me ask you a question. Have you felt helpless lately? You look around at all that's going on. You read the stories. You hear about the continuing climb in the numbers infected with the virus. You hear about the continuing climb in those who have died with the virus. Now we're beginning to get word from people that we know who know people who's got this virus and really don't even know how they picked it up and how they contracted it. And that's concerning. Every one of us, that's concerning. And we think, oh my goodness. Lord, when's it going to turn around? When's it going to stop? God, you're the one that spoke peace be still. And the winds and the seas obeyed you. This virus will obey you. God, tell it to stop. And God says this. you got to wait on me. It ain't in your time. It's in mine. But God, I, I want something for my children. I, I, want, I don't want our economy just to go... To pot. I want something for my children. I want something for, for their future. God, please. Just wait on me. It's not your time. It's my time. So, folks, here's the thing. God is all-knowing. Y'all believe that? Y'all believe that God knows everything? So does he not know Every time another of his creation falls to this virus, he knows. You say, then why? You skeptics out there will say, well, then why don't he stop it? If he's such a loving and mighty God, why don't he stop it? And you know what? I ask the same question. Oh, you mean you as a pastor question God? You better believe it. God, I don't understand. You know, we was rolling along. The church was, you know, the church, people's, people's being saved. Our bus ministry is rocking, and, and we're winning people to Christ, God. And, and some of those bus kids got saved, and, and Lord, we're, you know, things are happening. And now this, God, I don't understand. I don't get it. But I'll remind you of something, something that's been on my heart a lot lately. Job, if you've ever read the book of Job, if you haven't, go read it. You've got time. <laughs> You're sheltering in place. What else? You, you know, what better to do than to read the word? So go read Job. Go read Job, and then if anybody can tell me uh, where God gave him an answer to his questions, let me know, because you know what it amounts to? And I'm paraphrasing. This is a Ricky Bird paraphrase. You can take it for what it's worth. But basically what God told Job is, Job, you ain't God but I am. Job, did you do this, this, and this? No, you didn't, but I did. I'm God, Job, and you're not. And you know what? Job had to accept that. He had to accept it. So maybe it's time for you and I to sit back and say, God, you know what? We're not God. <laughs> We're not you. You are. You know. You know. So God is all-knowing, but guess what? Humanity, we're just ignorant for the most part, of spiritual things. Oh, sometimes we, we have a glory fit. and You know, we, we think we've, we know what it's all about and we think we know how to worship and we think we've just finally hit the nail on the head and, and then we realize, you know what? When it comes right down to it, we really don't have a clue. We just do the best we can. 
We just do the best we can. God is self-existent. But guess what? Humanity, we're totally dependent. Listen, God's self-existent. He don't need us. But we are totally, completely dependent upon God's mercy and his grace. You believe that? Totally, 100% dependent on God's mercy and God's grace. So what do we do? We pray. We pray and say, God, you're it. <laughs> you're it. We, we pray, God, for our president. We pray for our president. And let me say this. If you're one, and, 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 I, and oh, how guilty I've been in years past. How guilty I've been of just blasting our leaders for this, that, and the other. Just blasting them and letting them have it. Talking about them to anybody who will listen. When I should have been praying all along. So if you're one of those that's just out there blasting, coming and going, get over yourself. Our president can't fix this any more than you can. He don't have the answers any more than you've got them. He needs prayer. Same as you and I need prayer. The cross. The cross is necessary because of our sin. Because of our sin, Jesus had to die on the cross. Christ died on the cross for our sins. Thus, the resurrection was necessary because Christ died on the cross. So you see the cross and you see the resurrection. And the resurrection was necessary for our salvation. The cross is wonderful. And oftentimes, you and I as God's people, you know what we focus on? We focus on the cross. But let me clue you in on something. The cross is empty. He's not on it anymore. You see these little figurines sometimes and it'll still show a body hanging on the cross. I'm not real fond of those because he's not on the cross anymore. The cross is empty and it's good for us to look to the cross and it's good to us to think about the foot of the cross. The ground is level, we say, at the foot of the cross and that is so true. You can come to the foot of the cross and you can find forgiveness because Christ died there. But if it was only the cross, we'd still be lost. We must have the resurrection. The most important thing to a Christian is the fact not that the cross is empty, but that the tomb they laid him in after he died on the cross is empty. That's the most important thing. The tomb is empty. The resurrection brought Pentecost. And you know what Pentecost brought? The comforter. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost. We don't, we don't say much. We don't call it the Holy Ghost much anymore because we're afraid that's going to turn people off. But I like the Holy Ghost. I like to feel the Holy Ghost. I felt the Holy Ghost in the sanctuary of God's house today. I felt the Holy Ghost. But I don't have to be in this building to feel the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be in this building to feel the Holy Ghost. I hope you felt him at home recently. <laughs> And belief in the death, burial, and the resurrection. Notice that. All three. The belief in the death. Christ died for our sins. The burial. They placed him in that tomb. And the resurrection. He rose and came out of that tomb. Belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins brings salvation to our lost souls and gives us eternal life. We will not perish. We will not perish. You say, oh, preacher, but there's Christians that's dying from this virus. I'd be foolish to say otherwise. And you say, well, then how can that be? If the Bible says he's our protector, if the Bible in Psalm 91 tells us that he won't come anywhere near us, then how can it be that Christians are dying? Listen, we have to understand the context you and I live in is a sin-fallen world. And things like coronavirus are a part of that. And when we suffer, we all suffer together. The righteous with the unrighteous. The Bible speaks of God sending rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous, okay? It all, it, it all comes. But does that mean we just give up on God and say, well, then he's not a just God, he's not righteous, he's not a good God? My goodness, folks. If he chooses, if that's my means of getting from here to there, I don't want it to be. I don't want to catch it. You don't want to catch it. I don't want to die from it. 
But if he chooses that to be the means from getting me from here to there, then I'm going home. And I'll be with him. And I win anyway. It would just be my prayer that in the meantime, I don't give it to anybody else. Amen? So, we're all born with a moral conscience. We know instinctively that certain things are wrong. Did y'all know that? Think about it. We're born with a moral conscience. We just know instinctively within us that some things are right and some things just aren't right. We know that. The world's trying to tell us different today, but we know better. But here's the problem. We ignore our conscience and we're swayed by the sin nature that we're born with. That sin nature pulls and it tugs and it causes us to ignore our conscience. It causes us to ignore what we know to be right. And the next thing you know, we're out there in the world and, oh, we might say, yes, oh, yes, I I was saved back such and such, or I, you know, I, I was baptized at such and such church. And while we've got 600 and something names on the books right here at Friendship Baptist Church, and on a good Sunday morning, we might have 200 people in this congregation on a good Sunday morning. What would we do if 650 people showed up? Well, maybe we'll find out. Maybe when all this is over, we'll find out. Maybe we'll find out. We've become self-centered, folks, and we'll close with this. We've become self-centered. You know what self-centered means? It means it's all about me. <laughs> it means it's all about me. Forget everything else. What's in it for me? The sin nature, don't miss this, the sin nature, unless we deal with it, leads to the destruction of the human soul. Sin nature, unless dealt with, leads to the destruction of the human soul. So what about it today? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you been saved by His marvelous grace? If not, this would be a perfect opportune time for you to bow wherever you are. Confess your sins to Him. Cry out to Him and ask Him to come into your life and save your soul. Admit that you're lost. Admit there's nothing you can do about it. And you need Jesus for salvation. And I promise you, the Bible says, He that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That includes you today. That includes you. You say, well, I'm not at the church. I'm not in an altar. Make one where you are. But do it. Do it. Give your heart to Jesus today. If you're one of those Christians who before all of this still, you know, you, 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 even then you weren't given a second thought to come into God's house on Sunday morning, I want you to seriously consider changing that and praying and calling out to God and asking Him to give you an opportunity. Say, God, if you'll give me that opportunity, Lord, if you'll open them doors back open and we can all gather together back again, God, I'll be there. I'll be there. Would you make that commitment today? Would you do that? While they come and sing this song of invitation, would you give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ? Would you? Trials dark on every hand And we cannot understand All the ways that God would lead us to the blessed promised land but he guides us with his eye and we'll follow till we die we will understand it better
thank you so much for joining us. Um, we noticed that we had a viewer from Ohio. We had some viewers from South Carolina. And we just praise God for that. May he be glorified. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday um, on Easter. We're going to have some exciting things and looking forward to another message. And I just want to tell you real quick before we sign off that um, our pastor during the song service was not sitting down like he usually does, but he was pacing back and forth. And I could see him over there worshiping. And we long to see y'all. What a message today. Um, and we just praise God for it. We love you. Stay healthy. Stay safe. And if you need anything, let us know. God bless y'all is our prayer.